let's start by looking at some clinical approaches with some tried and true uh, treatment applications. And I hope that I can give you some suggestions and tips that might um, improve your patient results. It is very common to serial cast the PIP joint. I personally am an advocate of the use of plaster paris for no other reason than it is far more compliant and kind to the skin than any other material. It is important if you're using plaster of Paris to use gypsona, which is a very creamy material. It's the natural uh, plaster without many additives. One of the biggest problems is when we approach a serial cast, to be sure we leave the DIP joint free and we stop the cast exactly at the web space of the finger. You can see here that we are only about halfway on that proximal lever arm of the proximal phalanx because the metacarpal phalangeal joint is here, not here. So we really have not maximized the mechanical advantage of the lever arms. So I think there's a better way to think about this and approach it. Here we have an illustration of the serial cast as we would normally see it. Now let's look at a new concept. If you take a small amount of plaster of Paris and you wrap it around just the DIP joint, ending exactly at the axis of the PIP joint, you will allow this to harden and the DIP joint will be immobilized. Next, a piece of plaster is added, added volarly that extends all the way to the metacarpal phalangeal joint. This one is actually a little beyond. Here we see that we have a schematic drawing of a roll of past plaster of Paris that's reinforcing this. That's because this tongue is relatively flat and relatively weak. So I would roll a small amount of plaster of Paris wet and place it there. This illustration shows that I am doing this with a piece of thermoplastic, which will also work, but I determined that it would create maceration and I have discontinued the thermoplastic use. So here we have a hardened circumferential piece on the DIP. We have a hardened and firm volar piece here. And now I have wrapped plaster of Paris around the entire finger just as I would when making the usual serial cast. The great advantage of this technique is that I can hold this firmly because the plaster Paris underneath is hardened. I can hold this firmly because it's hardened and I can hold this firmly because there's no plaster Paris. So I can precisely position the PIP joint without putting pressure over the dorsum of the PIP joint. I keep smoothing this out as I'm doing it. So we see here that there's the length of that lever arm and that lever arm. And now in our new system, we have two much longer lever arms that give us more control over precise positioning of PIP joint extension. It's simply using the mechanics in a very smart way to get better purchase. In my clinical experience, this technique is particularly useful for little fingers because they are so short and the relatively and the relative length of the bones is small. So we're now making this a much longer and more efficient application. Here is the appearance of the finished plaster of Paris. And now we're going to look at a video which shows you this technique step by step on a model. We're using two inch plaster of Paris. This is gypsona plaster of Paris in lino weave which describes the mesh. And we're cutting this two inch into one inch widths. And after we cut it, then we're rolling up small rolls of this one inch. This simply makes it a lot easier to make this very small uh, serial cast. So now imagine that she has a flexion contracture of the PIP joint of the little finger. The little finger is often very short. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to put plaster of Paris from the PIP joint distally. We're going to let that harden. Then we're going to put plaster of Paris from the PIP joint proximally just to the distal palmar crease and let that harden. Once those two are firm, we then will wrap around with the usual um, configuration of a serial cast. And as we hold it here and hold it here, we will be able to precisely position the PIP joint having the longer lever arms both proximally and distally. And we won't be providing a pressure point as the plaster of Paris sets. So let's start with this very small roll. Now notice there is the cut edge, which is relatively straight, and there's the serrated edge. When I apply this to her, I want to apply the cut edge right at the PIP joint so there's a nice clean line. So I'm going to take this, always leaving the end available, and I'm going to immerse it into this water and then squeeze it ever so slightly. You want this to be wet because it will dry too quickly on you if it's not wet. I'm now taking this around her little finger, overlapping it on itself. And I like to work very wet. You'll notice that that is extremely wet, but I'm going to cut off just a little bit like that. And I then am going to take a towel and I'm going to dry it off just a little bit. That's perfect. And smooth it out. Now I'm not squeezing and when I put this on I didn't pull tightly but that begins right at the axis of the PIP joint. And it's immobilizing her DIP joint. While that is hardening I'm going to take another roll. I'm going to determine the length from here to here, which is actually fairly short. I need to square that off. And I'm going to fold that two, three, four, five, six. That six sounds good to me. I'm going to square off where the ragged edges are and cut off the corner of the bottom. I then dip that in the water and after I've dipped it I can smooth it out. And I'm going to place that on the volar aspect of her finger just like that. Not attaching it. Now every patient will try to help you by abducting and you really want them to maintain that finger fairly parallel. Now, as this is hardening right here, you can see that this, this is like a tongue. It's, this piece is fairly flat, so it's going to be fairly flexible because it's, it, it doesn't go around in a circle. So I'm going to take a little bit of this plaster of Paris, the same length as this, and after I wet it, I'm going to roll it up like that. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm just making a mechanical reinforcement right here so that this proximal lip will remain a lever arm force and won't break off. Now that will stay adherent to that because we put one piece of wet plaster of Paris on top of another. So we're going to let that harden for just a few minutes. Okay, now that each of these pieces has become firm, I'm going to take this roll of Plaster of Paris and dip it. And I'm going to wrap this roll around the finger. It doesn't matter whether it's proximal to distal or distal to proximal, because it's all the same tension. And as I roll around, I'm going to overlap it, making what you could call a traditional serial cast. But in this case, remember what's underneath is already hard. I want to be sure I've covered everything dorsally, so I've 
taking a peek that that is indeed covered. Now, once I have gotten this wrapped on, I now can hold here and I can press there because remember, underneath it's hard, and I now can position that PIP joint exactly. And when I do position it, I want to be sure that I rub dorsally so that the pressure is even over the dorsal. So now that it's hardened, you can see that the serial cast is form-fitting. There's a little reinforcement here, and it covers the entire dorsum of the finger. This serial cast uh, applied this way may be slightly more challenging to remove um, than a regular serial cast, but I'll show you the best way to do that. These are sold as serial cast scissors, although in reality they are suture scissors for wire sutures that are generally used in the operating room. What I will now do is I will cut on the radial and the ulnar aspect. Now, keep in mind, normally this would be hard, but we just put this on so it's very soft. And you can see that I've cut the dorsum. I then will peel this back. And at that point in time, I might be able to pull this off of her. In this case, I cannot. So I will actually need to cut a bit further. So I'm going to turn around this way so that I can see what I'm doing. And I simply will continue to cut distally until I can free her up and remove this. It is actually easier to remove when it's hard than when it's soft like this, because it's a bit easier to cut. So now I peel back over her PIP joint, and remember, if she's injured it, that's bulbous. So that now will allow us to pull it off. So you just keep cutting radially and ulnarly until you get past the DIP joint, and it will take a little bit of time, because when it's hard, you have to nibble and you go a bit more slowly. Now, I don't know about you, but I was taught that a serial cast should be changed every three days. And what I experienced when I did that was that the first couple of visits usually were very dramatic. But then things started to not be so much fun because, well, maybe there wasn't so much change. Maybe it would even go down a little. But, you know, over time it might go back up. But it, it just didn't seem to have a steady progression upwards. Then I was in a clinical environment where I actually was not able to see patients very often because I was working part-time. And this initial period of seeing and reapplying every three days was simply not possible. So in changing my technique to longer intervals, what I observed was this, that if I went three days the first time, that's fine. I get a dramatic response. But then the next time, maybe I double it. Maybe it's six days. And each time I see the patient back, I have actually an increased interval. And what I realized by changing it every three days was that I, I was demanding extension and pushing the tissues before they were ready or responsive to that increased range of motion. The tissues literally have to grow in response to the new position. And three days is not long enough. So instead of seeing an initial response and then a leveling off, what I would often see is I would see a patient come back after a long, longer interval, actually having greater active PIP extension than the passive position I put them in in the serial cast. My recommendation based on this clinical experience is to consider increasing your intervals the longer you are from the initial casting. I would also say that the, the stiffer the joint, unquestionably, the longer the intervals. But because there is an element of immobilization, I would no longer use this for really stiff joints. I would use serial casting on a relatively acute stiffness where I also wanted to assist the patient in reducing edema so that we can then transfer that into an active motion pattern.